church, and then we will do the Lord's Prayer with the prayers. And then we skip all the communion service part and go to the back last page where the benedictimus and the benediction and then the hymn to depart. So after the sermon there will be the prayers and then we'll join the Lord's Prayer and then we'll, and the offering will be brought forward and then we'll skip to the last page. So we kind of just lose track of what we were on here sometimes. Um, I got a call this morning, or there was a call this morning when I got here on the church's answering machine and then I called her back. John Clement is in the hospital. And so Marilyn has asked for prayers on his behalf. He's been in Marymount and they can't figure out what's wrong. He's running a fever. They run all kinds of tests. So please keep John and Marilyn in your prayers. And um, then we have two events coming up. The first is coming up the middle of September. It is on Brown's home opener, and our plan is to use that $500 that we got from Lutheran Church Extension Fund and have an outdoor watch party. And we're going to put the game on a big screen outside and invite the community and have free hot dogs and food and stuff. And we really need to be there. So we think we we're going to be able to put this on a big screen and put it on the side of the building and just enjoy watching the Browns win their first game of the season with the people from, from the area. And it's going to be a lot of fun for us to be together. And then the pancake breakfast is coming in October. We can talk about more of them. Then. then, take your newsletter. On the back side, you see the St. John Classifieds. Now you might look at this and say, okay, this is kind of cute. This is, these are things we really need. We really need people to step up and be part of this family and pitch in. And um, so you can go through the list there, but it goes on. I mean, I, I was telling somebody this morning, I haven't changed the letters on the outside. I do the outside sign. And so if you have an hour anytime and you say, hey, I'm here, when's the last time the bathrooms were clean? Come up, and then starting next week, I'll be here in the evening, too, because of his kids and basketball starting up. So please, if you have time at all to pitch in and do anything, and I know that, you know, the Chancel Guild is finding some people to be, you know, consistent volunteers, please think about being part of the family and pitching in to make sure that we are taking care of what needs to be taken care of. And then finally, it's with a sad sadness that uh, Pastor Ryan will not be with us after today. He and his trumpet are up in the balcony, but he is he and his wife are moving to Cincinnati. And so he has told us that when he's coming up here to visit his son, that he'll let me know and he'll be back. But please wish him, you know, God's blessings on your way out today because after his time with us today, we're not sure how soon he'll be back, but he's making a move um, partly related to his counseling job. I don't think I have anything else as far as announcements. If there's anything that you have questions about, talk to me on your way out of church or talk to each other on your way out of church. And I think we can stand now and begin with our opening hymn.
For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and just decrees so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, and which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly, as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our morning test is taken from the epistle lesson in Ephesians chapter 6, which was just read. It is incredibly rare, believe it or not, to preach about footwear. And yet, that's exactly what I'm going to do this morning, because St. Paul talks about it. When it comes to the topic of shoes, Usually that's up, left up to mothers, suitors, wedding planners, and also enforcers of dress codes. Usually you don't run to your pastor and say, hey, what do you think about my shoes? 
In our epistle lesson, St. Paul is outfitting the Christian from head to toe, and he does not forget about footwear. Footwear, interestingly enough, is a very interesting topic, believe it or not, and as a man, I'm surprised I'm even saying that, but it's true. I didn't think much about it until I went for my national degree in counseling. When I took my trauma class in the evening, I was in the class with about 24 other students. There were 25 of us. And on one particular week, we had a guest professor come in to talk to us. Now keep in mind, I was at Ashland uh, Seminary going for my uh, master's degree in counseling. So the professor we had, she actually came in from Akron University. She came in to talk to us about ALICE. I don't remember what ALICE stands for, but it's an acronym. It was for First Person Shooting, and ALICE program is set up for high schools and also for colleges. She came in, walked up to that podium at the beginning of class, introduced herself to us, and then she remained quiet for the next two minutes. After two minutes was over, she said, close your eyes, and she says, remember what I look like. And then she walked out of the room. Between 30 seconds to a minute later, she came back in, walked up to that podium, and she said, describe me. 25 students in there, including me, she got 25 different descriptions. As she started teaching us and running us through the course, she said, this is what we learned from Columbine. Whenever there's a shooter, she says that the SWAT team will ask one question when they come across in the hallways, a survivor. They will ask them, what was the shooter wearing on their feet? They wanted to know footwear. Because during the Columbine shootings and all the other shootings that had taken place in the high schools and colleges, everybody was on the ground. The only thing they were able to tell and see were the shoes, which was kind of funny or ironic, I should say, because the professor was wearing red ruby shoes like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. The only difference was they were sparkly, high heel shoes. There were about three people in class that got the description pretty close, and I was one of them, and the only reason being she knew right away Myself and one of the other people that gave a description, we were both military. So as soon as she said, take a look at me and memorize me, I ran through the salute uh, test, which is what I learned. So I took a look at her size, her action, the location, the unit, the time, and the equipment that she had. There was another uh, man that was in there, he was also Army, and he did, did the same thing as I did. The third person that got closer already went through Alice training before, and they began to peg again her shoes. Again, most people who have no military experience do not think first about shoes, especially when planning for battle. If you or I were let loose in the armory, we'd go right away towards the weapons. So we would pick up, back in our Lord's Day, choice of a sword and shield, worrying next about the helmet and the body. Today's standards, we would start looking at the pistols, the shotguns, and then we would start looking at the body armor, as well as the Kevlar helmets. The last thing on our mind, if even at all, would be concerned about our ankles, toes, and soles of our feet. The shoes that we would wear or the boots. That again is completely reversed with an experienced soldier. Especially a soldier who has experienced a forced march or whoever had to hold the line. Books and movies are filled with images of poor ordinary soldiers struggling to protect their feet from cold or from injury, especially when their boots are literally falling off their feet. Shoes, or even lack of them, can turn the tide of any battle. I did this when I was researching this uh, text for the sermon this morning. When you get a chance later on today, Google Scotland 
And Google Scotland's national flower. You'll be surprised. I was when I did. Their national flower of Scotland is the thistle. In order to take the sleeping Scots by surprise, an army of Norse invaders, sometime back in the 1600s, was ordered to remove their shoes so they could go in darkness and approach that army in silence. This is what the commanders did not anticipate. They did not anticipate or know that the field that their soldiers were going to walk through and cross in on bare feet was filled with thistles. So instead of attacking in silence, their shouts of pain sounded the alarm that led to their own defeat. And ever since that time, Scotland has honored the thistle as their national flower. Again, shoes and standing, they go hand in hand. Athletes and soldiers know the importance of standing for readiness. It's the exact same thing with the Christian soldier that St. Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 6. Even in the Old Testament, descriptions of Yahweh as a warrior, particularly in Isaiah 59 verse 17, whenever our Lord is pictured as a warrior, shoes are never ever mentioned. In the New Testament, St. Paul mentions them and it surprises us. Until we recall the plenty of opportunity as well as time he had to contemplate Roman boots, or in this case, Roman sandals, as he traveled to Rome in chains and then lived under house arrest. So of all the images that Paul uses, this picture of the soldier's shoes seems very strange to you and to me. Because the question is, how can the gospel of Jesus Christ serve as footwear for the Christian soldier? St. Paul again tells us, remember that the command given to the Christian soldier is very simple. It's only one word. The command is to stand. The command is not attack. It is certainly not retreat, but simply stand. In the whole armor of God, he has given to the Christian to enable us to stand our ground and withstand the assault of the enemy, which is Satan himself. is always there. So what can make the fulfilling of such a command possible, given the strength and fury of our foe? Simple. Paul again reminds us that a soldier needs shoes that provide protection. Matter of fact, I know with an absolute certainty that all of us in this room and all of us here now are wearing something on our feet. None of us in this room are barefoot. Even if you're wearing sandals, your feet are covered, or at least the soles of your feet are. I've got two shoes with me this morning, the ones I'm wearing now, and the ones I'm going to wear later, which are sandals, on the ride home, um, as well as to my son's house. Point is, if we are to stand firm, we must be certain our feet will not be exposed. They've got to be covered. And just as the shield of faith can protect us from the fiery darts of the enemy, so does the gospel's promise of forgiveness of sins by Jesus' death on the cross protect our standing from the shots and spears of the attacker, which is Satan himself. Neither our own courage, strength, or righteousness will guard us, but the promise of forgiveness, life, and salvation in Jesus Christ, our Lord, does. Paul also says that a soldier needs shoes that provide traction. Although it's an odd chain of images, moving from gospel to peace to readiness to standing firm does make sense. Because the gospel we all enjoy in the good news of Jesus' death removes every worry from our minds and enables us to plant our feet firmly on the ground to meet the attack without wavering, trembling, or even slipping. That's why we're always at peace, because we're always together again with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And because we are never worn out with care or worry, we are always ready. 
And we can begin to see why the shoes of the soldier deserves our attention. Matter of fact, when I went to basic training, believe it or not, that's the first thing they did with us. After we all got processed in, now it was time to go ahead and receive our uniforms, and that included our boots. Our boots and our socks. Because without those, there is no soldier. Helmet, breastplate, sword, and shield can do very little but minimize damage once the soldier's been knocked to the ground. At that point, the battle's already lost. That's why St. Paul reminds us we must remain firmly on our feet. Because it's only the gospel of Jesus Christ and resurrection that allows us to even stand. Paul says a Christian soldier therefore wears gospel shoes. And when Paul applies all this to his own situation, his own face-off with the rulers of this dark world, it's only the gospel that he mentions again. And he does not speak of wrapping the gospel around his feet. Instead, he prays that words will be given to him to proclaim the mystery of this gospel and do it boldly. And yet, we've got a fully armed picture of the Christian warrior in our minds and hearts when we read our epistle lesson. In that respect, again, he surprises us. And instead of saying, let them feel the edge of my sword, he prays that he will have the chance to show off his shoes. Paul prays that he will reveal the mystery of those shoes. Now we got to remember, again, that when Paul uses that word mystery, he's using it in a New Testament sense, not in a mystery writer sense. A mystery in the biblical sense is not a puzzle to be solved by the careful gathering of evidence and then figuring out the solution. A mystery in the biblical sense is a secret that can only be known through revelation. It's not something that you or I can solve on our own by our own careful observation or even cleverness. It can only be revealed to you and me by the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul's prayer is that he be given the words to make known to the world that secret that God has made known to us in the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord, dead and risen. That will happen when the gospel shoes enable Paul and all Christian soldiers to stand with boldness. Again, Paul's use of boldness fits perfectly with his use of mystery. Because to speak boldly is to speak freely. It means holding nothing back and not worrying about offending the hearer but rather speaking the way that you would to a close friend or even to a loved one. This takes courage, but Paul's main concern is that he's able to present the gospel of Jesus Christ fully and naturally in a winning way. And again, it's all the Holy Spirit's work. We are just his instruments and his tools. So in his bold presentation of the secret of the gospel, there's no room for I hate to tell you this, or maybe I shouldn't say it, but, or don't take this the wrong way. No, he's speaking great good news, and he wants nothing to hold back the joy that he feels in sharing the message of salvation. We should talk more about salvation and our grace in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ than about any other subject or topic on the face of this earth. And yet oftentimes it's the other way around. It's again the same great good news that allows them to take a solid stand without wavering or stumbling even before the Roman Emperor himself. Is that that same gospel and all that it speaks to us of the mercy, grace, and compassion of our God that shoes our feet and secures our stand. It's the same gospel that also will allow us to stand before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself when we meet him in our heavenly home. 
In its peace, we are ready for the attack and ready to proclaim all within the same breath against the devil himself as well as to this world around us. Why? Because our feet are protected and our stand is made secure. The gospel of Jesus Christ fills us with a peace that gets us literally on our feet to boldly proclaim the same good news to other people around us. No weapon, no strategy, and no insult can shake our stand when we are covered in the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God bless each and every one of you Are you as you are covered within our Lord's grace and by the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as you live in that grace now and forever. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We rise with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for everything you've done for us, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you that through his cross and through his death we have the true message and meaning of life, and that we have the strength to be able to stand against the assaults of the devil itself. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We ask and pray that you will strengthen our hearts and minds by the Holy Spirit, and that we will only be able to proclaim the great mystery of you and our relationship with you and what you have done for each and every one of us as well as for this entire world. Continue to keep us strong and by your side, walking hand in hand with us in this earthly world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you never fail to help those who call upon you for help. Give strength and confidence to your daughters and sons through Jesus Christ our Lord in their time of great need. That they will know that you are near and that you are your everlasting arms. We ask and pray that for are resting upon your protection. Eileen, Cindy, Chuck, Terry, Earl, Carol, Mike, Chad, Mary, India, Carl, David, Carla, Eleanor, John. will rest within your loving hands and that you will protect them. And that they will fear no evil, for you are with them to comfort them and deliver them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And we ask and pray your healing hand, dear Lord, about sanity as she remains in hospice care. Continue to watch over her and strengthen her faith and confidence in you. Reassure her and the family that they are surrounded and live within the gospel of grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Attend to her by the staff. Within hospice and strengthen her in body, mind, and spirit. If it is your will, dear Lord, to receive her to the heavenly home, we ask and pray that you will do that quickly as possible. And knowing the fact again that there's a great resurrection and reunion that awaits each and every one of us, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And we ask and pray for your peace and guidance upon Janice, Bruce, Marlene, and El Lord. We ask and pray that you will give them. Guide them into the right choices, knowing the fact that, again, any choice that they make in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is blessed. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And we ask and pray, dear Lord, to your comfort and care for the uh, family of the Cormatic family, also Hunky family, and also West family. Be with them as they grieve the death of their loved ones, but reassure them again of the glorious resurrection and reunion that it was them all in heaven. Continue to watch over them and walk with them hand in hand as well, and they'll continue through the serving world as we call them to their heaven homes as well. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we also ask you to pray that you would watch over Calvin, Andrew, Clark, John, Seth, Raymond, John, Michael, Connor, Carl, Jamel, and Seth, especially as they serve this great nation of ours within the U.S. military. 
It's easy to be with them and walk with them and look over them and also their families. Protect them during times of warfare and be with them and strengthen them during times of peace. Guard them, walk with them, and protect them now and always until they're reunited with their family members here on earth. Lord, in your uh, mercy. Amen. These and all of the petitions we have in our hearts and minds we bring before you silently. Let us bless the Lord. Thank you, God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.